example of a vulnerability in a library called log4j. You may have heard of this library. Um, so the freeform English text for this description is lacking a lot of crucial information for us to do this mapping. For instance, it doesn't mention that this is even a Java package, uh, much less exactly which Java package uh, we, uh, this is talking about. Ideally, we need this kind of uh, full package identifier that identifies the package in Maven, which is ultimately where most people will be pulling this package from. And there's another example here for uh, Jinja2 in PyPI. The description is literally just one sentence in Palette's Jinja before 2.10.1, blah, blah, blah. There's no kind of easy mapping to the name Jinja2 in the PyPI package repository. Now, also attached to most CVEs are something called CPEs, and this is, uh, I think, added by the MVD, uh, added in the MVD database. And this is intended to allow automation uh, when it comes to mapping CVEs uh, to people's software. And this is coming from a globally, uh, centrally managed database of identifiers. Now, the problem here, unfortunately, is that there is not a very good mapping from these CVE identifiers um, to actual identifiers that people actually use in their manifest files, for example. Um, and in general, these CPEs aren't very predictable or follow a very consistent pattern, so it's also very hard to generate them automatically. So what ends up happening is most people who care about the security of the dependencies, they have to either manually uh, uh, map their the dependencies to CPEs, or they have to rely on rather error-prone heuristics, both of which are not very ideal. And there's actually a bunch of other problems as well, unfortunately. We've also noticed in many cases that CPEs are added uh, several days after CVEs are first published, so there's a latency uh, in terms of when people are first notified about CVEs via this mechanism. And this is obviously not ideal because it opens the window of, of exploitation for people depending on that dependency. So lastly, CVEs also have this JSON schema. So I have here an example of the CVE JSON 4.0 schema. And unfortunately, it was also not very easy to automate on. Uh, there's a lot of freeform text involved as well. So for example here, log4j is just referred to as Apache space log4j space 2. Oh, I'm having the same problem as the folks from yesterday. Um, yeah, so and also the way version constraints are specified in the schema are not very well defined. So there's not very clear cut rules for how you actually apply logical operators and, and how you kind of combine different constraints. So there's a lot of ambiguity here that kind of prevents us from using this as an uh, automatable mechanism. Back to Kate. Cool, I'm back for problem number three. Uh, I'm the problem person in this talk. So many vulnerability databases. So we learned that we have these like blurbs on a typical advisory. Uh, and it's like a paragraph and it's not so machine readable. Um, there is a bunch of databases that are adding to that on top of that. So they're taking that data in, they're trying to add more metadata, they're enriching it, maybe they're making the description better. Um, one thing we're doing at GitHub is we're adding new vulnerable affected functions. So saying like, hey, don't worry about this unless you're using this function. So lots of databases are trying to add to this data and make it something better. And none of these people are talking to each other. So you might get some data enrichment from one platform and different data enrichment from another platform. And they're all speaking a different language because they're all using a different format for, for their um, advisories. So this is actually a screenshot from, have you, guys, have you heard of uh, Dependabot, anyone? Okay, so Dependabot, before it was acquired by GitHub, uh, this is a screenshot of the code base. And you can see these are all parsers. Uh, so they're taking in all, they're trying to aggregate from all these different sources like RustSec and PyPI uh, to make this product. And there was not a good way to do that. So they had to write all these different parsers to bring that into one platform and use it in one tool. So that's another huge problem. So OSV is our solution to many of the problems that we just described. Um, so what exactly is OSV? So there's actually two parts to it. So the first part is a vulnerability schema that we developed that allows us to encode vulnerability information in a way that's automatable and consistent. And the second is tooling and infrastructure that kind of aggregates, indexes, and makes this data uh, useful. Now I know what everybody's thinking. Um, everybody loves to bring up this example of the XKCD comic whenever someone creates a new standard, and often for very good reasons. But I promise we do have some very, very compelling reasons why we ended up creating our own. <laughs> so the OSV schema is something we developed in collaboration with GitHub and many other 
open source ecosystems have actually since adopted our schema. So what we wanted to build is a schema that's focused on open source, and that's as minimal as possible. So thinking about what is the minimal amount of information we need to encode in a vulnerability advisory to make it useful or actionable. And we wanted to um, provide a mechanism to uh, map advisories uh, consistently to packages in open source. We want it to be easily used by both humans, so humans should be able to read it and understand what's going on, as well as automation as well, so machines can automate uh, on that advisory. And we also wanted to generalize to most uh, all open source ecosystems, but not in a way that requires consumers of these advisories to have to understand the intricate uh, version constraint rules of that particular ecosystem as well. And more ambitiously, we want to build an ecosystem of distributed vulnerability databases and workflows for open source around this format, as well as easy to use tools around this format that everybody can use. And we really just couldn't find any existing formats that fit the bill and, and satisfies everything here. So here's a quick example of what a GitHub security advisory looks like in the OSV schema. And this is for a Go package. So as you can see, this is a very simple schema. It's fairly easy to parse as both a human, and it's very uh, easy to parse as a machine. So there's a basic usual metadata, such as the ID, some English text descriptions, uh, timestamps, uh, references. But most importantly, we have this affected uh, field, which allows us to unambiguously refer to package names and package versions. So taking a closer look at this, this uh, uh, advisory is clearly referring to a Go package uh, with a given module path. So the OSV schema provides very clear definitions for every single e ecosystem. And in most cases, in all cases actually, um, the name that's specified for that ecosystem matches the native way to refer to that package in that ecosystem. So there is no need to do any kind of mapping. Now, the, the more complicated piece here is how do we uh, deal with versioning? How do we describe which ranges of versions are affected? And we wanted to build a way that's both simple to understand, uh, as well as being expressive enough to encode all the different complicated cases there might be when it comes to, say, encoding which branches are affected and things like that. So these versions should match exactly the version numbers that are uploaded to package repositories, or they can also be git commits. So what we came up with was, was to mark flat events on a kind of version timeline or a version tree with where a vulnerability was introduced, where, which we mark here in red, as well as where a vulnerability was fixed, which we mark in green. And this kind of generalizes well to both kind of linear uh, version numbers as well as get trees. And the, the way that we encode this data with kind of fixed information also makes it useful to consumers because it tells people which versions they need to upgrade to to fix a vulnerability or what patches they need to apply. So commit level metadata for vulnerabilities is actually quite an interesting thing that we want to explore. If we think about what goes into a security advisory, we, we can really streamline this into a process that work, works closer to a developer's commit uh, and development workflows. So we can imagine a world in which developer they fix a vulnerability by, fix, uh, by pushing a commit. Now this commit could, could have a reproducible test case or could have a unit, unit test. And then we could have automation infrastructure come in, perform a bisection, and give us exactly the commit ranges that contain this vulnerability. And then from there, once we have these commit ranges, we can correlate them to the uh, Git version tags in the repository, and ideally the, the versions that are uploaded to the package repository as well. And finally, for a description of the advisory, you can just take that from the commit message. So what we end up with is something that's essentially a security advisory that's generated in a much more streamlined fashion, and it's aided a lot by automation here. We've also seen many times in the past in many open source projects that people push a lot of fixed commits without requesting a CVE, so this is something that might help with that as well. In fact, we already have some real-world examples of, uh, of, uh, that start to follow this, exam, uh, this workflow in a very limited way. So on the left we're here, we have an example from the Global Security Database, which is run by the two Josh B's in the front. Um, so they uh, receive a lot of Linux kernel vulnerabilities from Linux uh, maintainers, actually. 
And this is done at a commit granularity. So every uh, vulnerability has the commit that fixes the vulnerability, and in many cases, the commit that introduced the vulnerability as well. And from there, what our automation can do is we can populate the version tags that correspond to that uh, commit range. And similarly for OSS Fuzz, which is uh, the fuzzing platform that our Google open source security team runs, we do something very similar. So with fuzzing, we have reproducible test cases, and that allows us to perform bisections on every vulnerability we find to figure out which commit introduced the bug and which commit fixed the bug. And from there, we also do the same kind of version analysis, and we find that in this example, in the mRuby um, uh, software, we affect, this vulnerability affects the 3.0.0 RC version. Now, what about adoption? We've actually made some pretty good progress here. So Kate here from GitHub has helped um, get the GitHub Security Advisory Database using the OSP format. And there are several other open source ecosystems, such as PyPI, Go, Rust, and, and the, Glo the Global Security Database has started using OSV as well. And one other thing we did was we collaborated with the people behind the CVE 5.0 schema, where we suggested a number, we successively, uh, successfully suggested a number of changes to help uh, improve the way packages and versions are specified in the schema. And in the future, this will allow uh, better interoperability between the two different schemas. So the second piece of OSV is OSV.dev, which is a tooling infrastructure that makes all of this data useful. So OSV.dev is completely open source, and what it does is indexes, it aggregates all the OSV formatted databases that are out there. And it also provides some of your automation to, uh, to do some of the commit-based vulnerability workflows that I just kind of went through in the previous slides. So right now this works for OSS files, um, but we're looking to generalize this into a mechanism that works for everybody. So to use OSV, you can either check out the web UI at osv.dev, or we provide a very simple API you can query. So we have three examples here. You can query by either a package name, a version, we can query by a package URL, or you can query just by a commit hash, because commit hashes should be fairly unique. Um, so it's completely open API, open source, no red, lim red limiting whatsoever. It's a batch version, so uh, this is something that we, uh, we really want everybody to use. And the second piece of this is that we started to work on user tooling. So the first part of this is just a simple vulnerability scanner that's able to scan SBOMs in the future, uh, package manifests, image containers, anything out there that can be scanned, we want this to be able to scan. And this is just a starting point. With kind of a common format, we can all collaborate to build tools to make this a vulnerability management workflow easier for everybody. Back to Kate. Cool. Uh, let's talk about GitHub specifically. So why did we take on OSV? What was going on? What was going through our minds? Um, remember before when we were talking about the life cycle and how it ended at publish? And then all these other people in the crowd who I used as examples uh, were like, no, I have other things I want to add to this. So we decided we didn't like that. Uh, and we decided to launch a new feature called Community Contributions. So now if you're looking at any advisory listed on github.com slash advisories in this bottom right corner here, you can click this link which says suggest improvements for this vulnerability. It opens up this form. You can change exactly the metadata that you want to change. It's not a paragraph. It's not an essay. It's not a black box uh, because what it does is open up a pull request. Uh, and those pull requests are reviewed by our delightful curation team who work very hard. They're sitting in the back here. Uh, and so you have experts who are reviewing that and making sure this is actually a valid contribution before they merge it and change that advisory. So you can rest assured with that whole process. Um, here's the thing. Uh, to have this pull request thing happen and to have that out in the open, that required us to have a repository. Uh, and the repository had to be filled with all of these security advisories that would potentially be changed. So it's one file per security advisory that is filling up this whole repository. And, and once you're thinking about that, the question becomes, how are we going to format the data in each of those files? Because this is going to be very public and used by a lot of people, so we want to be intentional about that choice. Uh, and that turned into a conversation that was like, it's about the schema, but no, it's actually not about the schema. Uh, and so it, it grew into a much larger conversation. 
This was very early in my time at GitHub. Oh, here's another picture of all the files. Um, and so we decided this was the moment to take a step back and define really what our vision was for this team. I'm a cheesy person. This is about to be cheesy. Uh, if you are emotionally lactose intolerant, maybe just check out for like 30 seconds and then come back. So, so we imagine this future where no human is impacted by security advisories. And that's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And it may not actually be possible. Uh, but if there are organizations who can push that goal along, it's GitHub and Google. So we have a responsibility <laughs> to our users <laughs> in order to aim big <laughs> and make sure that we're advancing that cause as much as we can. Uh, and, and really, when you think about it, it's just three things that you need, just three. So the first is you have to have all of the information, all of it. Uh, the second is that it has to be 100% actionable. So whatever information you have, you have to be able to do something with it. And the third one is that you have to put it in people's hands. So it can't just be on the GitHub platform, because we know some of you host your repositories outside of GitHub, and that's OK. Nobody's perfect. Uh, but we need to be able to make sure that you, too, can resolve the security problems that you have in your code. And so how does OSV fit into this? Kind of affects those second two there. So let's dive into those a little bit more. So if we want to have 100% actionable advisories, again, this is a dream. This is the future. This is not tomorrow. I see the curation team nodding in the back row like, not tomorrow. Uh, but this is the dream. So that means that we have to match all of those relevant packages to whether or not you're dependent on it. So it's one thing to say, like, oh, the OSS fuzz package it has a vulnerability. And it's another thing to say, do I care? And we need a machine-readable way for us to do that. Um, right now, the way we're formatting this is with this matching system of the ecosystem name. So something like composer, uh, and then the package name, which is the name of the actual package that you're harnessing. And we match those up through a package registry. So it has to be spelled correctly. Please don't put typos in your uh, draft advisories. Uh, and, and so this was important. And when we thought about the schema that we were going to choose, it had to maintain that relationship and be machine readable so that we could continue to match up. Here's the advisory with whether or not you're dependent on it without any humans getting involved. Um, next, in their hands. So it has to be really easy for private parties to build tooling on. Uh, there are a lot of forks of this big open source repo that we have. There are a lot of people who are already building tooling on this. Um, I talked to one last week who was like, he was basically building his own Dependabot. Like he, he like harnessed all of the data and then was building something such that he could alert repositories on both GitHub and Bitbucket that he had uh, that, uh, that they were vulnerable to something. So we needed something that was predictable. Uh, we needed something with variables that made sense. Our own internal schema had a lot of shorthand in it. Uh, that was not something we could have published without sprucing that up so people could understand what was going on. Uh, and we needed something that was machine interoperable. <laughs> um, so that, we did this whole big comparison. We talked about like using our own schema. We talked about our own schema, but in JSON instead of YAML. We talked about uh, OSV, but with YAML instead of JSON. We just decided that was the lawful evil option. Sorry, Oliver. <laughs> uh, so we talked about a lot of stuff. And ultimately, what we landed on was that OSV checked all of the boxes for GitHub. So they use that same ecosystem and package name relationship that allows us to match up this advisory with whether you're dependent on it. Um, it's also easy to be, build tooling on for the same reasons that I just said. Uh, and, and finally, last but not least, it sort of builds towards this like bigger than GitHub universe, right? Because we, we have a lot of parsers in our code. We're also pulling in all the same sources as OSV. Uh, and so we, <laughs> we are interpreting a lot of data uh, and some stuff outside of OSV. So we have to change a lot of data to make it make sense in OSV. It would be really gosh darn nice if the whole industry would just use OSV. And then we wouldn't have to maintain those parsers. Uh, and other people wouldn't have to maintain their parsers. We could all just talk to each other with perfect communication in a machine readable format. And how often does communication become perfect with no misinterpretation? Isn't that an amazing world that we all want to build? Everyone's laughing at this point. That's great. So, so this is the future that we want to get to here. So let's go through that life cycle of an advisory once again. We talked about it before. This time, there's going to be more things on there. Uh, so first, Jonathan in the back discovers a security advisory. He alerts Trevor in the front, who starts drafting that security advisory. They get a CVE because they're responsible. 
And then next up, they automatically, if it's created as a GitHub repository draft advisory, it generates an OSV file for you. You don't have to do any work. We are doing that for you. Um, that means it can be picked up by osv.dev, which a whole bunch of other people have built Tooling on. So not only are you broadcasting that on your GitHub repository, you're broadcasting it to everyone who ingests OSV. You're also broadcasting that to Dependabot and all of the other competitors to Dependabot um, who, who take that advisory and say, hey, I see this version number, I see this package name, um, I'm going to automatically send an alert to everyone who is using that package name. Um, so then you're, you're broadcasting way more than you would by just listing this or, or tweeting it out somewhere. Um, the end user actually gets that fixed because that, that security advisory is in their face. Uh, in, in terms of GitHub, it's in their GitHub repository. Please fix this. Um, and then last but not least, if more people come along, like Sam in the front row who says, no, I have, no, I have more information that I need to tell you about, she can commit, excuse me, they can, Sam can commit a community contribution, and uh, that goes right back to the draft process. It updates everything there. Uh, it generates a new OSV pile. The whole thing repeats. All of that, like, machine learning stuff happens, and so, not machine learning, machine readability stuff happens, um, and everyone gets more information in the world to resolve the security advisories that we're pursuing. Back to you. Cool. <laughs> so what's next for OSV? There's still a lot of work to do here. Um, the first is still more vulnerability feeds. So we have pretty good coverage of most language ecosystems, largely thanks to Kate and GitHub here. Um, but we're still missing things like Linux, uh, kernel, uh, Linux distributions like Debian and others. And what we want to build is the most comprehensive distributed uh, vulnerability database of all uh, vulnerabilities in open source and make it easy for anybody to publish advisories using this format as well. And we started to work with, for example, Debian on getting OSV uh, advisories for them as well. So essentially what we want to do is to build an ecosystem around the OSV schema. If everybody uses this format, as Kate mentioned, everybody benefits because everybody can collaborate on the same tooling and everybody has the same parser uh, and everybody works on pretty much improving the situation for everybody else. And finally, there's actually still a lot of work left here to um, deal with false positives. So we've, we've made some good initial steps with matching uh, packages to, uh, to advisories just by looking at the package name and the package version. But this will undoubtedly result in a lot of false positives in, in some cases. Um, so VEX here uh, is an awesome initiative to try to address this, but we need to figure out how this can fit into open source. So perhaps there is something we can do here with automation. In the world of open source, we have a lot of visibility into what goes into a security patch, for example. If every vulnerability had the fixed commit, for example, we could potentially use automation to figure out which code paths need to be called in order for that vulnerability to actually affect the end user. And then from there, we can do some kind of source code analysis, and perhaps we can reduce a lot of false positives uh, this way before reporting vulnerabilities to everybody. So this is something that we want to explore. Uh, don't know how successful this will be. Um, so if anyone wants to talk, about, talk about this, I'm very happy to chat about that. Um, and finally, you can try out OSV. So again, you can go to osv.dev or try out our API, and you can also try the GitHub Security Advisor database. Yes, yeah, so you can jump onto github.com slash advisories and submit a community contribution, as mentioned, um, or you can fork our new open source repository uh, at github.com slash github slash advisory database, or if you have feedback, you can tweet it right to at Kate Catlin. There's my, there's my uh, Twitter profile name. And that's it. So if you have any questions or any thoughts, you can file an issue in these three repos here. So the first one is for the OSV schema itself. The second one is for the osv.dev tooling and infrastructure. And the third one is for the GitHub security advisory database. We also have a channel on the OpenSSF Slack. So if you go to slack.opensf.org and look for the osv underscore schema channel, uh, we're there. And we also have a mailing list as well. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
So I couldn't hear you clearly. Was the question why are we not using package URLs? We do support package URL, URLs in this schema, actually. So there's a field that I haven't shown in our example, but there is a package URL field you can fill out. There's someone in the back, I think. Beat you. Yeah. So, um, so could you speak? Speak a bit louder. Is there, or is there a microphone that um, can pass? I can yell if you like. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> My hair is not as good as it used to be. Sorry. No <laughs> So I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So we, we support package URLs, which um, are one mechanism for linking or of talking about which package uh, and what version uh, is affected. And we also have our own kind of table of ecosystem and package name that you can specify as well. Right. And well, the reason I was mentioning about U, like URIs versus URLs is like URL is like where something out. It's a pointer towards something. And the URI is the thing that identifies it. So if you're targeting the URI, that means if I'm going like I, my company never pulls from a, directly from a URL for a given, for a given package. Uh, we, because what we do is we aim to, we always pull things into our own repositories, and then we deliver from there. And so if we say, well, this URL, that URL may actually end up changing from moving from one environment to another. So, but if it's a URI, an identifier as opposed to a URL, then that actually gives us something that's more, that we can have that's canonical, that works across different repositories, different groups, while still uh, allowing us to identify the thing. So, so I was asking if, if, uh, if, there's, if there's a place that we can come and possibly give some of this feedback and help with collaboration there, if, um, if it's not bottled like that. Yeah, so, so when we say package URL, it's not actually like a, Euro, like a HTTP URL to that actual package. So this is a, a pretty generalized um, way of referring to uh, the package in the ecosystem. So this is saying, in the Maven repository, this package here, Apache struts just too cool at this version. Right, and, and in that one, like package Maven is like they're saying this is the Maven repository, but mine, it might be package Maven slash my company slash and then the canonical name is there. So having yeah, it in that yeah. format actually ends up uh, breaking my, uh, like that, that prefix on there, if you're tying that into your, into your scanner, uh, ends up uh, breaking the, uh, my ability to, like I have to work out, well, where did this package actually originally come from? And that, that's, the, that's the feedback I'm trying to give, is that when you start to work with internal systems, it's not about only supporting the, uh, the open source, uh, always online, always pulling from, from external. Like, I have regulatory concerns that, I'll, that this allow me from pulling from there directly. I have to pull it internally, perform my scans, put it in my own repos, which is, means we're not going to hit the same, the same names. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'll tell Okay, cool. And that, that, that's what I was trying to get to. Is to, to make yeah, yeah. Uh, and in general, I think, because most vulnerability databases wouldn't know about your internal package repository, I think uh, in those cases, you might need to kind of figure out what is the canonical um, package ID for that to be actually, to make that useful. Sorry, does someone else have a question here? Just, Justin? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask, what do you all think the role of human curators are on these data sets uh, going forward? Uh, I think the question is, what is the role of human creators uh, for these data sets going forward? Kate, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, speaking from our experience at GitHub, indispensable. Um, at this point in time, there, there's no substitution for that human touch. Uh, making that description better, uh, making sure that it's explained how you can actually fix this advisory, there's so much that goes into that. Um, there are ways that we're trying to harness machine learning so that we can make that faster, like maybe take out the stuff that is, uh, that doesn't require as much human thought, but at this point in time, there's, there's just no way to take humans out of this process. 
So we do have a question online. Um, it's from Reinhardt saying, I'm thrilled to see GitHub and others are making it easier to report vulnerabilities. At what point do we need to start thinking about the quality and accuracies of those reports? And so, okay, so the question was uh, reporting new vulnerabilities or is it about like just in general those, those vulnerabilities that we're pulling in? The question is at what point do we need to start thinking about the quality and accuracies of those reports? Oh, at, at all points. Um, today, yesterday, last week, uh, I think that's really how GitHub started to develop their niche in this space is by saying uh, we're going to choose quality over quantity at first. Uh, and so that's why we started with human curators. We had you know, a huge focus on that and making sure that it's high quality. There's been a number of times where we've gotten an email that says, why aren't you all reporting on this CVE? And we say, because we looked at it, we read it, and we said, this is inaccurate, or we're not going to send out alerts on this, or this isn't high quality, or this isn't really a security issue. So there is a number of those that we're pulling down and not sending alerts on. Um, that, that's very much a thing that is, that is on our minds, and, and not even on our minds, like in our hand, like we're doing things about it. There's also a second part to the question, and okay. it, it is, what about malicious actors slash competitors? Uh, I'm assuming they mean like a malicious actor submitting an advisory that isn't actually true. Okay, cool, gonna run with that. Uh, so, so yeah, that could potentially happen. And, and again, I would say that's why we have a curation team. Um, and we have this new community contributions function. So if you notice something that we may have missed, it's out in the world and we're publishing it, and you realize, no, 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 this is about a package I own, this is malicious, et cetera, we're gonna make sure that um, you have a way to flag that. Right now you can just write it into a community contribution. We have on our backlog, it's been there for a while, uh, adding a functionality that just says dispute um, and making sure that it's really easy to flag and dispute advisories. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that it's, it's very possible and it is coming up and it is happening. Uh, and so we're trying to make sure we have ways to handle that when it does come up. Oh, so I think we're going to cut off. So um, feel free to come up and we can chat. <laughs>